Hey everyone, welcome to the Rinks Around the League. Have you ever wondered what it's like to work in the NHL? Well, you're in for a treat because on this episode, I'll be sharing some of my experiences in five NHL seasons working for the Edmonton Oilers. This is going to be a pretty fun episode to watch, and I'll get to some fan questions at the end. Without further ado, let's go. Hey everyone, welcome back. Rinks Around the League, of course, is partnered with Ross Flats Vintage Apparel, the Arcadia Brewing, and Second String Leather Company. This is going to be a little bit of a lengthy episode, but I thought it'd be cool for me to share with you kind of a realistic breakdown of what it's like to work in the NHL. Now, this is what it's like working for a club team in the league, not working for the actual league. That's something completely different. For you, the viewer, I want to provide a peek behind the curtain on what it's like to work for an NHL club and also serve as a reference for those aspiring to work in the NHL. Now, right off the top, I must stress that this is my own personal experience uh, of my five years in the league and other employees with different backgrounds and life situations will have an obviously different experience. But I thought it'd be fun to share my experiences and my time in the NHL. I started with Hockey Canada as a photography and video coordinator uh, in 2009 and I was actually there for the 2010 Vancouver Olympic push and I was around that organization when we won uh, double gold. Unfortunately the sledge team did win gold um, but the men and women's team obviously did win gold and it was a really exciting time to be around that organization and really uh, my career really grew and took off from there in terms of video. I've always been interested in combining kind of two of my main passions, which is hockey and photography or videography. So Hockey Canada was really my start, a little bit more in depth in that video. So if you want to check that out later, you can. And I got started with the Edmonton Oilers in the summer of 2013. All right, my job with the Edmonton Oilers was manager of video production and I was in charge of four to five staff in my department. Now, I gotta say that my job there was probably hands down the best job in the entire organization because even though it was, you know, handling the video, when you do video for an NHL team or a sports team, you're not just covering what's going on with the team. You're covering um, stuff that's happening on a corporate level you're dealing with sponsorship videos, you're fulfilling sponsorship agreements, uh, you're doing ticketing videos, you're doing 30 second ad spots for television for season seat uh, renewals, uh, you're doing HR videos, you're doing fun, you know, ice, ice bucket challenge videos, you're doing uh, hunter videos. So it really spans a huge and vast uh, array of content for an organization. So video production and the video department of each NHL team uh, much like the social team, is an extremely valuable uh, department in the organization because they are literally the voice to the fans and, and their clients. So it's a very important role and one, one that I really appreciated because you got to know not only the team, um, you know, everybody thinks that's what it is, you get to know the team and the players, but you also get to know uh, ticketing, marketing, sponsorship, HR, uh, the venue, staff, security, almost every single department, uh, the executive level, you get to know absolutely everyone in that organization. And, and that's kind of a cool thing. You know, a lot of departments don't really, you know, work on projects uh, with other with other uh, departments in, in the, in the uh, organization. But when you're video, you, you wind up doing everything with everyone, including the team. So. It was, uh, it was a ton of fun. We were there for some pretty epic milestones. You know, uh, the farewell of Rexall Place, the building and, and opening of, of Rogers Place, uh, the first playoff experience in a, in a, in a decade, and uh, the draft and, and the selection of, of Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. So uh, I was there for a, a pretty important uh, span of years in that organization. When I first started with the Edmonton Oilers, my salary off the hop was $57,000. Um, this increased over time over those five years with small uh, bonuses and raises. But when I first started with the organization, that was my salary. And it depends on where you are in, in, in your phase in life, uh, that could either be like a lot of money or it, it's not a lot of money. And in my case, it was, uh, it was not a lot of money. You're definitely there doing it for the passion of you know, being involved in the team. And for me, being a part of my childhood team 
uh, and kind of reaching the pinnacle of video production and hockey working uh, for the Edmonton Oilers. And the other thing to keep in mind is just, okay, so that's your salary. What is your working hours like? And we'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, you know, the hours are all over the map when it comes to your time commitment to the job. A huge misconception that uh, kind of like teachers, you know, oh, well you work all, all season, you must have the summers off. For my five seasons there, we only made the playoffs once. So, you know, four of those seasons, well, you, you have the summer off. <laughs> no, no, uh, anyone involved in directly with hockey ops in the team know that you know, when the season ends, no matter if you make the playoffs or don't, uh, that's not the end of, of <laughs> your, your year. Um, there's uh, scouting combines, there's drafts, there's free agency, uh, there's uh, summer camps, uh, draft. There, there's just tons of stuff during the summer, as well as prepping ideas heading into the next year. And uh, you know, when I worked there, we were building Rogers Place. So uh, each summer was dealt dealing with with that construction project. So you know, there is a common mis misconception out there that you know we don't do anything in the summer. It's pretty chill, right? It's definitely a little bit of a slower pace, but it's busy nonstop. It, it never ends. During the NHL season, again, there's kind of this misconception that you know you're working and covering the team while. There's game days, which is kind of on average every second or third day there's a game. And during those non-game days, you're, you're not doing anything, but it's nothing can be further from the truth. You are, uh, the days that the players are not playing a game, uh, they're practicing. So the NHL and the NHLPA reach an agreement in their collective bargaining agreement that they have uh, four days of, of, of rest a month. So they call those CBA uh, off days. And during those off days, the players are not allowed to engage in anything. No, you know, no training, no sponsorship deals or, or uh, sponsorship commitments. They, they are mandated those four days off. Now, those are the days that we are filming uh, other sponsorship gigs, um, catching up on other stuff, editing. Uh, editing is, there's always tons of editing to do, archiving. So even though the players get those four days off, it doesn't necessarily mean that the staff get it off. Uh, I actually started logging hours, like actually how many hours I've spent uh, a day uh, working and on the job. And one month in September, just looking back on my notes, um, I logged 300 hours uh, in a month. And so that average is about 13 hour work days. It's a lot of hours. It's, it's, a, it's almost a life commitment when you get these jobs. You don't have a lot of time for, for anything else. So on top of salary, you have to look at your, your hours allocated to doing that job, which is a lot. <laughs> I'll just put it that way, it's a lot. The biggest one, when you work in the video department, and uh, like I meant, already mentioned before, you kind of have uh, a lot of connections and relationships with the entire organization, is uh, you have unbelievable access uh, to the game's biggest stars. Uh, you know, when Connor McDavid was drafted in Florida, you know, I was one of two guys that were with him the moment he got off stage uh, as a member of the Edmonton Oilers all the way through to meeting his parents. It is really kind of wild to walk around with him, seeing, inter seeing him interact with other players and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just, it's an unparalleled experience. Um, definitely one that will uh, last a lifetime for me. Uh, you also get to kind of see how things work. You know, there's a, there's a ton of things that I had no clue how it worked. And you know, this, this job really opened my eyes to not only how you know, public relations work, um, the importance of uh, getting the message out and, you know, kind of putting the organizational spin on things uh, to developing jerseys and coming up with uh, ways to introduce the jerseys, uh, you know, in secrecy without fans knowing. Like, you get to see all the stuff behind and then you, you look to Twitter and you see everybody engage in all this, you know, uh, crazy fan talk and you just look at that and you go, if only you guys knew. If only you guys knew what was really going on behind the scenes. So you get a you get a pretty cool uh, glimpse on how things work um, for a team. Uh, but with this uh, job, it was just again an, an unparalleled experience uh, traveling on the charter with the team, 
basically being flown, bused, hoteled in every single major US city pretty much. And uh, you're kind of traveling like a rock star. You get to see pretty unique things. I, I made the point every major city that I went to, I always made the point of, of seeing what there could be seen. Like in Dallas, going to the you know JFK assassination spot, the, the arch in St. Louis. Like I had no idea you can even go inside that arch until I was there and, and I went up it. And you know, just things like that where you know, I would never have those experiences if I, if I didn't have this job. So it was, uh, it was a pretty cool experience and traveling basically first class everywhere is just, and dealing, doing it with uh, your childhood team is just, it's, it's unparalleled, it's pretty awesome. When I started there was you either got one thing autographed by one person or you got one item autographed by the whole team. What I used to do with our web team was I used to get these photos enlarged. Uh, you know, I'd go to and buy some Ikea frames and I would ask my director at the time, you know, can we get one for each member of the team? And so um, that was kind of my thank you to the web team and the web department is I got these photos, usually ones that I'd taken and got the whole time, to, the whole team to sign them framed and I would give them away as, as kind of gifts as a thank you. So, you know, we do get autographs, um, but when we're working so closely with the team, it's almost taboo to ask um, for, autog for autographs. It, it's kind of unprofessional um, to, you know, start working, go, hey, you know, hey, Connor, can you sign this? It's, it's kind of unprofessional. So we, I don't really have a ton of autograph stuff, but um, you, you do somewhat get access to it. And that kind of dwindled over time. I don't think they do that uh, at the Oilers anymore, which is kind of bad because, um, you know, an employee, you work your butt off, it's kind of a, a nice perk to have. Again, I always made a point of no matter what NHL city I was in, I got to know the photographer. I even talked to all the Zamboni drivers because I was always interested on what made the ice in that particular rink um, tick. So, you know, I always talked with as many people as I could. I, I really tried to soak up the experience of traveling to other venues and hence the reason for this show. I mean, that's the reason why I made this show is to kind of share with you guys what what I experienced traveling all over the league so well hands down it's a pretty exciting environment you know sports and entertainment is a pretty um, pretty exciting environment just by nature of, of the content that you're covering you just never know what's gonna happen you could win you could lose uh, something magical may happen or something devastating might happen you just never know so it's, it's always a very exciting environment um, no two days are alike and it's pretty exciting got to work with some amazing creative people in sports and entertainment you know there's so many people that I worked with that did so, so many creative things that it just blew my mind and it was also just awesome working with people that had kind of the same passion as I did with uh, Oilers and Oilers content. Um, you know, probably the best example of that is Rexall, Farewell Rexall Place. We did a series saying goodbye to Rexall Place and everyone on the team had buy-in. Everyone on the team had some creative input on that. It was kind of our love letter to Rexall Place. We wanted to make sure we captured the history of that building um, because when ultimately it gets torn down, that will live forever online and fans can look back and remember those, those times. Pros is the pride of working for your childhood franchise team. Like if you're a, a fan, a genuine fan of the team that you're covering, um, it, it's a great source of pride. You know, you, you tell all your friends, you, you showcase all your work. It's, it's a, you know, not a lot of jobs out there. You go to work every day and, you know, you pinch yourself like, I'm, this is my workplace. And so a lot of pride goes in behind it. Like I mentioned earlier, the work hours are just relentless. It's, it's a lot of work and a lot of work hours. Uh, you work a lot of, um, quote unquote vacation days, New Year's Eve, uh, I think CBA, I think the players get Christmas day and Boxing Day off, but right after that, they're right back at it. Um, long weekends, free agencies, usually on a holiday. Uh, the draft usually is around then too. So you miss a lot of holidays. And you know, for myself during this whole time, you know, I began working for the Oilers with two children, two young children. Uh, and when I, by the time I left, I had four children. So it was very difficult to balance that, um, 
work-life schedule. Um, so the work hours is a lot. So if you're if you're gunning to work in the league, it does it, it is a lot of hours. You know, a lot of stuff gets dumped on your plate. Like I said earlier, you wear a lot of hats. You know, typically you're not just a video guy. You're not just a manager. You know, my title was manager of video production, but you know, I was still pretty hands-on running the live stream, the TriCaster, uh, shooting video features, cutting them, you know, not only because I wanted to do that, but because there was just a, so much content you had to do, um, whether it was a panel every week or uh, shooting someone stand-up, there's always something to do. So you wear, you wear a lot of hats uh, working in sports entertainment. And uh, you know that it's fantastic because you kind of get your feet wet in a lot of different areas, and you kind of have a, a wonderful opportunity to really mold projects the way you want them to look. Um, but at the same time, it, it really wears you down. I watch a lot of people break into the league, and you know they go through the motions the same as I did. They're really excited, and you know they, they're going guns blazing. But after year two, three. It, it starts to wear at them and you, you can see it, it really grinds them down. It, it's a grind, it, it really is. But I would say that in probably the pay, um, the salary, the Oilers, I would think in the league, were kind of a little bit on the higher end of salaries, but even that was a, a little bit of a stretch. So I think the work hours and the salary, I think a lot of people have this conception that you know, oh, you work for a professional sports team with million dollar athletes, so you must make a, a pretty good <laughs> wage, and, and it's not. I think people were always shocked to, to know how much I made. So I think those are probably the two two biggest cons is, is the hours and... And that brings us to work-life balance. Um, this is a con, but I wanted to kind of do a separate section on this one because work-life balance, you know, it's kind of tossed around in every job that I've ever had. Is, you know, you gotta make sure you have a good work-life balance. And I tried my best to really balance that as much as I could, but it was still extremely challenging. I've looked around during my five seasons there and you see people go through the motions, you know, you see people get divorced. Uh, because they're never home and you see other people that would love to date and have a, rela a relationship but just don't have the time because they're always at the rink and always working so it, it's extremely difficult to maintain a life outside of work you know there are some people that work uh, inside the NHL world that they're completely fine with that if you are someone who uh, is trying to maintain a relationship outside of you know this job it is really tough and it really wears you down. So that that's a huge thing. And there were a lot of very difficult times where, whether it was birthdays or wedding anniversaries and stuff, um, you know, New Year's Eve was often a, a common one where I was usually on the road or something like that. And you, you miss those moments with your family. And as a family man, growing up with small children, you, you realize real quick that when you miss these milestones, you never get them back and ultimately that's what I chose at the end of this but uh, it, it's really tough now I was lucky to have a, a really good boss um, I'm gonna name drop Mark Ciampa you know he he was really good at understanding my demands outside of work and he was able to let me uh, you know be as home as much as I could uh, but I do know that there's a lot of bosses who aren't like that who just want the job done and they don't care about what you got going outside. So it really is, you know, depends on the organization that you work for and your bosses. I was fortunate and lucked out I had a good boss. Uh, I know a lot of people didn't. For the most part, we're all just kind of regular guys, um, hockey players. The, the really high-end elite players, they kind of feel a little bit uh, standoffish a little bit. And you know what, I don't, I, I think that kind of comes with the territory. They're always in demand. They're always getting pulled this way and that way. And I, I also think you don't really get to that level of stratosphere when it comes to talent in the NHL without having some, a big ego. You know, you, you have to think that, that way in order to perform at that level. So yeah, you know, some of the higher end players, they're not as friendly. They're not, um, they're typically not as uh, personable as others. Um, but you know, most of the players are, are just kind of regular guys, nice guys, and, and they're, they're
they're easy to get along with. And I often get asked, you know, what's it like working directly with the team? So, I mean, do you get to go and have beers with these guys after or have dinner with these guys? And for the most part, when I was there, there is a definite line um, of almost like a professional line between staff and, and the team. Our relationship with, with the players was very much a professional one. You know, we weren't really encouraged to uh, chat with them a, a lot. Like if in the locker room and stuff, we would, you know, hey, how you doing? We would have brief conversations with them, but in no means um, were we allowed, nor would we want to just sit down and be like, hey, what are you doing after the game? Do you want to go have a beer or whatever? Like it, it's, it's not like that. It's a very professional environment. I remember there was times where we would be on the road going to a restaurant and, you know, a, a group of the guys would come into the restaurant or, or the, the bar or whatever, and we would have to like kind of leave and not be around. It was kind of that way. But towards the end of my time there, I kind of loosened it up a little bit uh, to not be so stringent on being so uptight around the guys. You have to remember that, you know, especially when you're when you're around the team with a video camera, you want the guys to be comfortable around you and not to feel awkward. You don't want it to feel awkward. Uh, I learned later on to, to open up a little bit more and not be afraid to, to have a conversation uh, with the guys, to not f uh, be awkward, you know, riding in, a, in an elevator with Connor McDavid and having a two minute conversation. It, it, there's no uh, problem with that. One of the times I filmed Neil Yakupov for an episode of True Blue, you know, I shot the episode with him and his sister and the dog. We went for a walk. After I was done, I took the mic off and I packed up my gear and I was like, okay, Nail, I'll see you at practice. And I left and Nail came to the door. I was like, hey, Nasher, like, my mom wants to make you tea. And I was very professional. I was just like, no, nope, thanks, Nail. I appreciate it, but you know, I got to get going and I'll see you later. And he's like, no, 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 Nasher. Mom wants to make you tea, come in. So I actually went into Nail Yakubov's home uh, his mom, really sweet lady, made me like a really traditional kind of Russian snack dinner type thing. It had like egg, uh, like fish eggs and, and toast and smoked meat and tea. And we just sat around for like an hour um, having tea with Neil Yakupov and his family. It was, it was a pretty cool experience. So, you know, you, you pick your moments. But uh, it definitely isn't, um, you, you're treating them as co-workers, not as your friends, I guess, is kind of a good way of putting it. One of the cool things that I always, uh, that I was surprised to find out was just kind of how casual some of the guys are after games. Now, after the game is done, the game is over and the media do their interviews and they're gone. Uh, if you're on the road, typically players will, will have about five, 10 minutes um, in the hallways to talk. And there's always guys, you walk down the hallway and there's always guys that are talking with each other or meeting family or, you know, uh, there's family members that know uh, some other players via trades or they used to play in that town they meet other players or, or for, uh, old friends and stuff so uh, it is kind of a you know you you think it's kind of like a hatred of, of the rival of the team and you wouldn't be caught dead talking to anyone on the other team but you know it is a pretty relaxed even after playoffs there, there are moments uh, after the game is done walking through the hallway where players are talking with each other uh, in those hallways So it, that kind of surprised me a little bit All right, I always get asked what is Connor McDavid like? Um, now obviously I don't know Connor very on a personal level, but just being around him for three seasons um, being around him when he got drafted and you know seeing how he interacts with the with the team and stuff um, you know, he's a, a quiet guy through and through. You know, what you see in the interviews, he always gets, I think he gets probably teased on how quiet he is in the interviews. But, uh, you know, he's, he's just a professional guy. You know, I think he's lived his entire life in the spotlight. So, you know, he's, he's a pretty cautious guy. And um, it, it's kind of cool. I always kind of take pride that when I did my interview with him, for his True Blue episode, I actually got him to laugh. You know, I think he's one of those guys that, I think if you are an interviewer um, talking to Connor, and if you can get him to smile and laugh, I think that's a huge achievement. Um, not a lot of people do it. I take pride in, in make, getting him to smile <laughs> on, on, on camera, so I kind of take pride on that. But he's always in demand, and he's always being 
tug this way and that. So he's he's a very busy guy, and uh, I think the byproduct of that is that he's he's just a kind of a, a generally a reserved person. And to be honest, in this day and age with social media and stuff, things catch like wildfire. And I think Connor, um, at least the impression that I get is Connor really wants his impact on the ice to make the biggest statement. You know, he doesn't want his name in social media for bad, bad uh, reasons. Uh, obviously, I grew up watching the Oilers of the 80s and watching all of the Stanley Cup championships. You know, I got to meet him when we did interviews for things like for Rexall Place, and he was around for the 84 Cup reunion. When he was named as part of the organization, I think that's when he really started to join us on road trips. And, <clears throat> you know, I think myself and, and guys like Tom Gazzola and, and Mojo and Blaine, and we all kind of pinch ourselves because the greatest player to, to ever play the game is, is riding the bus that we do <laughs> all the time on the road. And, you know, I almost, there was one time in, in the playoffs in San Jose, I had to do a, a photo or something with him and Kevin Lowe. And after we did filming, he was like, so Jeff, like, what do you think, how are we going to do tonight? And just the fact that he knew my name, I almost... <laughs> One fantastic moment that I had was when we were on the road in Tampa, we actually had to film a uh, Sportsnet segment we call Ask an Oiler. And Wayne was just kind of around our team and he wasn't really doing much. And I just kind of, was, you know, I turned to our PR guy and I was like, what if we did Gretzky? And he's like, oh, that's a good idea, I'll, I'll ask him. And we did it and it was so, it was just so thrown together last minute. And it was so cool to, uh, do a feature um, with with him and everything that is said about him is true he's a very well spoken I've I apart from probably his public engagements like the 84 reunion hot stove lounges and stuff every story that he says behind the scenes I don't think I've ever heard him retell the same story twice and that that kind of uh, that stuck out to me somehow because I think it's all, always easy to rehash the same story especially if it's a good one but Wayne always always told different stories and it just you always caught yourself just listening to him and I, that was again a really cool experience that I had with him and not only him but meeting his family you know got to know Ty a little bit and uh, he, he got to hang around with the team as well and, and got to know Ty a little bit and again just being around those guys is just it's just awestrucking two seasons with the Oilers were, I mean, arguably some of the worst years in the franchise. Um, you know, you're working with a team that's bottom of the league. I mean, this is the time, a decade of darkness, the, the time where fans were throwing jerseys on the ice. And it's just, it's not a pleasant experience being around a team that is losing a lot. And, you know, oftentimes what gets lost in you know, the high performance million dollar players is that like these guys are actually, they're, they're people, <laughs> like they're actual people that have feelings and, and emotions. And when the team loses, man, it's really hard. Um, everything sucks. <laughs> like uh, the, the stress level is through the roof. You, you know, it's a, it's a winner take all um, uh, job environment. And you know, you're not just talking about the team, you're also talking about players. You have players that are just kind of cracking, cracking the lineup and they're just like, man, I'm gonna get traded. I'm gonna get sent down to the minors. I'm never gonna play in the NHL again. And that's a, it's, it's an extremely stressful environment to be in. A high performance environment is, is a very stressful one. Their jobs and their livelihoods are on the line and that's an extremely stressful thing to be around. And I think that kind of gets lost. Not, not uh, Fans don't really realize that. When you're on the road trip, you get on that charter, you know, when you head into your first game, there is a very palpable sense that, okay, this is the trip that's gonna change things. Like, this is the trip that things are gonna turn around. We just need one win. And you get into that first game, you get into the warm-ups, everybody's loose and like, okay, this is it. You know, you're feeling good, everything's positive. And then you get, you know, killed 5-1 or something. You just get absolutely, just murdered on, on the ice. And you know, the, the game ends, you go into the locker room with the camera to do your post game interviews. No one wants to talk, everyone's mad. 
you know, you get onto the bus, you get onto the plane, it's dead quiet, the players aren't talking, they're getting food, and you can literally hear a pin drop on that charter. And, you know, no one's making eye contact, everybody's walking on the plane like this, and everyone's either thinking they're gonna get traded, they're gonna get sent down, or the, you know, the coaches are thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna get fired. It's a very uncomfortable <laughs> environment. You stretch that over many road trips, um, like if you're on a six game road trip and you haven't won in the first four games, you know, the fans are getting on them. Um, it, it, it's just, it's really, really uncomfortable uh, to be on there. And, you know, as a web team, you're trying to get content. So you're trying to ask these guys to do, hey, can we do a fun feature on you? And, you know, you you're on a losing road trip uh, the players don't want to have don't want to have anything to do with it and it's just it's just a very hard environment and you know stretch that over a couple years it's a very it's a very stressful and 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 very uh, uncomfortable scenario is the best way to uh, describe it one of those years during my time we were the winning team so what is it like working for a winning team as you can imagine, it's the complete opposite. Everyone is smiling, everybody is loose, everybody is happy. Uh, the players are more willing to talk and give you those sound bites, those video shoots. They, they want to be in the spotlight. Um, they want to uh, become a fan favorite. Um, everyone's better to work with. You know, the coaches are easy to get along with. Uh, management and the organizations are easy to get along with because they're happier. Uh, winning really does cure all. Um, and it's, it's night and day. And, you know, I remember this road trip, we were in Montreal and we won uh, in overtime. I think Anton Lander won, uh, scored in overtime. And, you know, you get on the charter, you know, the, the staff is more chatty. The players have the music going on in the back. They're playing poker in the back. You can just tell guys are visiting and laughing and joking and guys are walking up and down the aisle. Like it's just, it's so much different when they win. And I'll never forget, we landed into to New York. Everyone was really excited about it. Everybody was was talking a lot, and and just the, the, there was a buzz on that charter uh, heading into New York. And then we ran, ran into Barclays Center and get absolutely killed. It was like Super Bowl Sunday. I think it was four nothing after the first period, or five nothing after the first period, and the rest of the trip just went downhill. But it just kind of shows the point of like when you're winning. Everything is just much more pleasant, much more enjoyable. Everyone, the coaches, the players, everyone's more um, excited to deal with. But uh, when they lose, it's it's just so it's just so bad. Winning winning is everything, and it's so much better when they win. When the when you go on a road trip, usually it's usually it's a few um, stops along the way. So an eastern swing might look like. You go to uh, Tampa, Florida, you play the two Florida teams, you fly up to Carolina, you maybe go to Chicago and come back, or you might go to Boston, New York, New Jersey, uh, Pittsburgh, um, Philadelphia, head back. Uh, on the west side, you would do, you know, kind of your western swing, so San Jose, LA, Anaheim, Vancouver, uh, Denver. So usually when you go on a road trip, there's a, there's a swing, they call it and you, you, you do roughly four, four to six games. And six games is a long, long time. Um, but when we travel out, usually the team will practice before we fly out. They'll practice, they'll load up on the charter, they'll fly to their destination. So let's just say they're playing in Chicago, you fly into Chicago, um, usually the day before a game. There's a CBA clause in the, um, in the travel requirements that um, you can't travel on a game day. So I think it changed with the pandemic stuff, but generally speaking, you can't fly into Chicago on a game day. You have to be there the day before a game day. Fly into Chicago the night before, usually the afternoon. You, know, you have dinner and stuff, and then the next day you would wake up and you would have practice in the morning. Usually um, the home team would practice first, which is around 10 o'clock, and then the visiting team will practice at 11.30ish, and then there's a gap in between. 
um, where the team will travel back to the hotel, have a, a nap. I can never nap, <laughs> but uh, a lot of the players have a chance to rest. Then they got to pack, they got to throw all their stuff on the, on the bus because when they head to the rink, after they play the game, they have to get back on the bus and head straight out to the airport. Most times, uh, the team will fly out right after the game to get to the next city. Remember, you can't fly into a city on a game day, so they always have to fly out right after the game. And it's a pretty tight window. In some uh, cities like San Jose, they actually have a curfew of flight. You can't take off after a certain time. And uh, once we got iced in Buffalo, we had to stay over an extra night in Buffalo, but uh, in normal circumstances, they will fly out right after the game to get to the next city. Traveling with a team is fairly stressful. After a while, you kind of get used to it and you can take kind of take pockets of time to enjoy yourself. But when you travel with a team, it's, it's not relaxing travel. You have to make sure you have to be on the bus on time. You have to make sure you're at the rink on time. You have to make sure you're back on the bus, on the plane to the next city. You roll into the next city at like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning sometimes. You got to get up for the bus the next morning. You got to hit the, you know, you can't miss anything. So it's not a relaxing time. You're, you're in and out of your suitcase literally every day. So it's not like you arrive to a city, unpack your bags, you're there for seven days. It, you know, it doesn't work like that. Um, in playoffs, it's a little different because you're not traveling to other teams. You actually are staying in one city at one time. So it is, it is a little different, but it, you're always on the move. And I would say by the third or fourth uh, game, you start forgetting your room number, you start forgetting what floor you're on. Um, it, the, the, the travel schedule is a bit of a grind. It's fun, uh, but it is, it is a grind. All right, some advice for people who want to work in the NHL. Um, I, I would say start in, in the minor system, so to speak. So I got my start with Hockey Canada. I think that's a good place to start. So look at your amateur hockey associations and start working on there. Get your experience going through that. Um, you know, obviously this will depend. This will vary depending on what uh, uh, career path you or career you take. But you know, start start with minor league associations. I started with Hockey Canada, and a lot of people use that route to graduate into the NHL. So start with there. Um, always apply. Um, teamwork online is kind of the main one the NHL teams all post uh, jobs to or sports teams to um, but never never be afraid to throw in your hat even if you think you're underqualified um, oftentimes what happens is even if you are qualified but maybe don't you don't meet the cut that time you may wind up with a job later on or at least the the name will be familiar with the people who are doing the hiring and you know, I actually went for an interview before with the Oilers and didn't get the job. And then I got offered, the, I got interviewed and got offered the job. So it took me twice to crack the Oilers. But um, you know, my wife was uh, instrumental of me getting the Hockey Canada job because I didn't think I was qualified, but she's like, she told me, just apply, you never know. Just throw your hat in the ring, you never know. And I did and I nailed the interview and I got the job. So. Always try, always throw your hat in. It uh, doesn't matter if you think you're uh, inexperienced or not. Always, always apply. You just, you never know. Internships are also another great way. You know, I hired some, some, some great staff through the internship route. Um, internships uh, are a great way to gain a lot of experience and also prove yourself. You know, if you are uh, a great intern and, you know, do a really, really good job, um, then it's almost like they, they can't not hire you. So uh, internships are a great way to go. Um, you know, just know what you're getting into. It's a very highly demanding job that doesn't pay overly well and doesn't leave you a whole lot of extra time to do uh, contract work to subs you know, subsidize the, the lack of funds. So just know what you're getting into. That's enough of me rambling on of um, points that I wanted to talk and, and might get into sub content later on. But I want to quickly get into some fan questions. One person writes, favorite Northlands Coliseum Rexall place that I've watched live. Um, as a kid, I, I watched some fantastic games. I never got to watch any um, Stanley Cup playoffs or championship games or anything like that. In terms of my last five years working for the team, 
um, I would say some of the greatest moments, sports moments. Um, when Connor McDavid came back after injury and scored that ridiculous goal against the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, I've never heard a crowd cheer like that in a long time. It was phenomenal. Ryan Smith's retirement night uh, was a pretty emotional night. I think that was my first year in the in the in the NHL. And anyways, it was it was a kind of a, a really cool emotional night um, seeing him end his career. Did I have full access to NHL rinks? Um, when you work for the team, you have media passes. Um, I have mine, a lot of mine framed up above me here. When you get to the rink, you you arrive at the rink two hours before puck drop. And during those two hours, you know, you I was capturing B-roll and stuff like that. But you basically have free reign. Um, Apart from the visitor locker room, um, I I could go basically anywhere in the building, and that's where I I did my panoramas and shot my photos. So basically, have free reign. Some some arenas have tighter control security. MSG uh, has extremely tight security, um, and that's a given being in New York. But um, on road trips, does team staff always travel through the night, or do they have to wait the next day? Like I mentioned earlier. Um, Generally what happens is the game ends, they pack up, they get on the plane, fly home or fly to the next city. That's generally how it works. What is the most unexpected thing that's happened in your NHL experience? I mean, to honestly, the most unexpected thing was is just being around the greats of the game uh, as much as I had. Uh, Wayne Gretzky and Connor McDavid. I never would have thought that would have, when I first got the job, I would never have thought that would, would come to be or, or happen at all. I thought I was just gonna be with the team and, and, and hanging out with them, but to, to be around some of the greats of the game uh, was not, <laughs> I was not expecting that at all. Best meal I've ever had on the road. Um, that's a tough one. I had a lot, a lot, a lot of, I was very fortunate my, my boss is, uh, was a huge foodie. So every single city that we went to, we always hit up the great uh, spots, but uh, Burn Steakhouse in Tampa is, just an, another experience. It's highly, highly recommend going to Burn Steakhouse in, in Tampa. Um, there's a couple other spots. There's a steakhouse, I think 1932, I think in Winnipeg. I think that's what it's called. Um, another phenomenal spot. Um, New York, there's some great, uh, I mean, there's, there's just too many to, to count, but I, I would say probably uh, the best meal food-wise, probably burn steakhouse. Uh, do NHL players smell as bad as regular hockey players? <laughs> this is my mom. <laughs> no, they do not. Uh, a big reason is because the trainers actually dry their equipment. So when the team travels, uh, the game ends. I, I guess that's one of the unexpected things I'd, I'd totally caught me by surprise is how quickly the players get undressed after games. And if you played beer hockey, if you played rec hockey, the post-game beers is kind of the best part of the game. You get to sit around and chat and, and talk with your buddies and stuff like and have a few laughs. The NHL players, they get dressed probably in like 30 seconds. <laughs> like, I'm not joking. They, they go in, they tear off all their equipment, they hit the showers. They don't waste any time. When you're on the road, they're actually the same thing. Their, their equipment is in their bags, on the trucks, to the bus. They don't waste any time. And when the, the charter lands in the next city, the players and the, and the staff go to the hotel, but the trainers actually have to take all that equipment and gear, go to the arena, hang it all up, dry it, um, and get ready for the next day. So the trainers are, are absolutely the unsung heroes of players and teams they do so much so the, uh, all the players equipment gets uh, treated and air dried so they do not smell as bad as regular rec hockey players so do NHL players have to spit like that one of the one of the craziest things about COVID playing rec hockey because I spit when I play too and it's hard, it's just something you do to, like you, you, when you play hard, you get phlegm in your mouth, you wanna get rid of it. So you, you know, water bottle, spit it out. But during COVID, at the brief amount of time that we were able to play hockey, that was one of the things that they, uh, we couldn't do. And I, I gotta tell you, 
it was weird not being able to do it. And I, maybe it was just habit, but um, we couldn't spit. And it was really, we got in like, the arena tenants came and gave us crap for it. So it is something that was just weird not to do, but um, it is, we just do it. Uh, why do goalies pour Gatorade down the back of their neck? This one comes from my aunt in Calgary. Um, one of the things that, again, maybe is a kind of a things fans don't realize is that, yeah, you're inside a hockey rink and it's cold because there's ice there, but it's not really cold. Um, I remember playing minor hockey in really cold arenas and f just freezing, freezing facilities. And then I remember playing in West Edmonton Mall and we actually got to play at Rexall Place. And one of the things that I noticed right off the hop was just how hot it is. And you're wearing all that equipment and you're hustling around that ice as hard as you can. You get hot, it gets unbelievably hot. And obviously hydration is how you combat that, but the goalies are even wearing even heavier pads that that's why they drench themselves because it, it gets hot it, it gets really hot and you know play three periods in an overtime it's it's unbearably hot so thanks for hanging in there that was a really long one if i didn't get to your question or if you have another question that i didn't answer on this episode uh, leave a comment down below and i'll answer it as soon as i can um, follow me on social at underscore the rinks for all updates on rinks around the league and other episodes on this show. So if you're here and if you like what you see, subscribe and like this video and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.